Okay. Go ahead, Ivy. Okay, welcome everyone. Greetings wherever you all are. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you to the African Fedge Forum seventh webinar. I think uh, we have been having many of these. I'm excited to see all of you. I'd also like to especially thank Dr. Yvonne Martins for giving us this chance today to present to us, give us this talk today. My name is Ivy Chimulwa. I'm a Master of Science in Molecular Biology candidate studying at Makere University, Uganda. And I will be, I was privileged, I was asked to talk about my country, Uganda, so that we can just get to know a little bit about my country, the part of Africa. So those there are my details if you need to get to know me more. And I guess let's just start. <laughs> um, as you can see, let me just figure this out. Um, as you can see, uh, Uganda is full of color. It's rich in its serene beauty and brilliant life and has an abundant biodiversity, which I'm sure it's very good for us enthusiasts. So shown in these photos are in the bottom there, you can see the hills of Kabale, which is located in the western part of the country. And also you can see Markison Falls located in the northwestern part of the country. So in the west, we have the Renzori Peaks, which reach towards the sky, the perfect challenge for bold explorers who are coming to visit the country. And also across the nation, we have all these widely roads leading to places of grand beauty. Uganda is unrivaled on the continent as a bird watching destination with over 1000 species of birds, which are found in some of our rainforests depicted in that photo that there is Mavira Forest which is located, um, I think, on the way as you're heading to the east of Uganda. And across the nation, we have a various national parks, which are home to some of the world's most exotic animals and a very, very huge ecosystem. Culturally, culturally, there's a story at every turn, as Ugandan people are very rich in culture. And we have very many tribes which have preserved some of their culture right from the ancient times. In the photo there, you can see Kasubi tombs where those women are walking to. So that's um, a burial place for the kings of Buganda, which is a tribe found in the central region of the country. And in the top right, you can see some of the kings and some of their regalia, some of the things that they used to use during those times displayed at the Kasubi tombs. And tourists can get a taste of all our culture ranging from the north, the west, the southwest, eastern at this place in the central region called Ndere Center. So we have down there, that picture shows a bunch of the troupe. Um, they perform these different dances and everything. Basically our culture is packed in just that one place. So if you're to visit the country, it's the one place that I would always advise you to go to. And when you look at our education, it's basically structured in um, pre-primary, primary, secondary, and post-secondary ed education, where you see most of the tertiary institutions. And in this slide, you can see um, some of the tertiary institutions we have in the country. And these ones are clearly just depicting the country, the tertiary institutions that are involved in fage work. You have Makere University, where I am from, then you have Chambogo University. Some of our, our enthusiasts here in African French Forum are from there. And we also have Kampala International University. So coupled with its great scenic views and all that culture and everything, we have um, the most daring adventures here in Uganda. Um, in that photo there, you can see zip lining through Mavira Forest, like I talked about earlier. We have white water rafting on River Nile among many, many, many more, because we have a variety of stuff we can do here in Uganda. And not to forget our vibrant nightlife when the city comes back to life again, as usual. I always say that there seems to be no rest for the people of Uganda. So I would just like to take this opportunity to thank the organizers of African Page Forum to give me just this short intro. It is mostly pictorial because that's the best way you can explain Uganda. <laughs> That's how best you can bring out Uganda. So thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to share this story with you and you the listeners for going through it with me. I think I am going to welcome Dr. Nandi to give us the introduction of our speaker today, Dr. Yvonne Martins.
Thank you. Okay. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I want to present uh, Dr. Eva Martins. So, um, doc, you can take out the slides while I read the profile. Uh, Dr. Eva Martins is a researcher at the Center of Biological Engineering, University of Himeho, Portugal. Her current research is focused on the development of phage based tools for the diagnostic and treatment of neurodegenerative disease. For that, she uses phage display technology as well as genetic and chemical manipulation of the M13 by two phages. Um, it's interesting because we uh, have taught over the years, uh, we've been working about on phage, phage therapy, and we want to know uh, other uses of phage. So for this, um, we'll have um, Dr. Ivan talk to us on phage display and all the source for new applications. Uh, Dr. Ivan, you can take over the slides. stage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Nadi. Uh, thank you also to Ivy. Beautiful landscapes. I loved your presentation. Thank you also to Africa Fitch Forum for this invitation. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here to give this um, presentation about fish display, um, which is an old resource that can be used for new and innovative applications. So I presume everyone is uh, seeing already my screen. Uh, yeah. So, talking a little bit about phase display technology. Uh, these two words together, uh, do you know what they mean by separately? Um, if anyone has some things you can to say, you can say it in the chat, just to try to disclosure what these two small words mean individually. If someone dares to write something in the chat. Okay, everyone is embarrassed. So the um, word phage, of course, that's all, all of you uh, know. That means the bacterial phage. It's viruses of bacteria. And the display is to show or exhibit or make visible something. Okay, so this technique allows us to manipulate a given bacteriophage in order to display at the surface of this page of this phage a given molecule of interest. So it was first described by Professor Charles Smith in 1985, um, and uh, it was um, awarded a Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2018 for the phase display of peptides and antibodies. So this is a technique that allows the insertion of a specific sequence in the genome of a bacteriophage with a consequent expression on the surface coat of the phage. So this was the technique first described for recognition purposes or to identify a given target or a given receptor. But along the, these, these last years, this technique evolved and we can now use it as um, uh, the phages itself, itself, as a platform or a scaffold, as a building blocks or um, engineered biological systems. So the, filament, the filamentous phages that are mostly used for the phage display technology are the M13. So we can also use other phages from the same fam family like the F1 or the F3, but the M13 is uh, usually the most used one. And also we can use other phages that are not filamentous like T4 or T7, there are also some um, reports using these phages, but I am not familiarized with, with uh, those types of display. And I'm going to talk about in this presentation only about the phage display with M13. So the M13 is a very simple um, phage. It belongs to the Inoviridae family. 
It is basically like an extendable tube, thin tube, that packages inside the DNA, a single-stranded DNA. It, it has um, a total of 11 genes in the genome, and they are aggrupated um, depending on the function of these genes. So this phage um, has a coat protein, like most of the phages, and the, the protein of the coat that we usually use to perform a phage display is the protein P3, that is one of the extremities, is one of the is in one of the extremities of the phage. And this protein possesses um, five copies. Other uh, proteins that we can use um, with, uh, to work in this phage is the major code protein, the P8. That is, I can see the, the pointer. So you can see here in one of the sides, the protein P3 with five copies, but along the corp the, 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 of the phages, you can see their uh, major code protein called P8 with 200, 2,700 copies. And this is the, the protein that is mostly used for chemical functionalization of the phage. And the protein P3 is the mostly used for genetic manipulation of this phage. So to perform genetic manipulation of M13, we can simply manipulate the genome in order to introduce in uh, the gene of interest a given sequence that will be then displayed, displayed in fusion of the, with the protein uh, of interest. In this case, I have here represented um, and the introduction of a given sequence in the gene three of this phage that will consequently be displayed on the protein three of the phage. This type of manipulation allows us to um, develop phage display libraries in which the phages have random sequences at the surface and also to develop phage particles with um, peptide sequence or any other molecule sequence at the surface with that we already know what it is, okay? The other manipulation that we usually perform in this phase is chemical manipulation that, as I told you before, we use the major code protein, the protein eight, and we can manipulate chemically this protein in order for the phage particle to display fluorescent compounds, for instance, or a drug compound for therapy. So these are the major, the two major valences of this phage that we can take advantage of. Here we can see some of the phage display applications, okay? both in vitro and in vivo, we can use this technique for a diversity of purposes. So if we want to study protein ligand interactions, if we want to uh, functionalize uh, different types of particles to identify some receptors in a given target. So you have here like a small summary of some few applications of this, this technology. So for the recognition purposes of phage display, we need to use phage display libraries. And these libraries are um, a collection of phage particles, each one displaying a given sequence, a random sequence that we don't know um, what it is. So the purpose here is to have a collection of phages that will allow us to incubate with a given target in order to identify a possible receptor that is being expressed. So these libraries, we usually buy them. They are commercially available. 
but we can also uh, synthesize them in the laboratory. So usually we can see libraries with seven amino acids or 12 amino acids. So if you are interested to, to create your own phage display library, you need to follow some simple steps that this is available at the commercial um, manufacturer if you buy the, the, the library, where you buy the libraries. So you can also um, try to do this in the lab. We already did it and we obtained some good quality libraries. Uh, so you need to have uh, in mind the, that you need to have the DNA of the M13 phage, okay? You have here represented the, um, the map of this phage. You can see here the, pro the gene three that, will, that codifies for the protein three of the surface. So the first step for you to create your library um, is to introduce in this vector of your M13 phage a given insert with unknown sequence, okay? So here you have a small sequence of the gene three of this phage that is flanked that uh, possesses in the multiple cloning site these two constriction enzymes. If you di digest the, um, the DNA with these two enzymes, you will obtain your vector open and ready to receive a given insert with the same echoesive hands. So for you to synthesize the insert, you need to order some primers. And this is basically a primer annealing process. So you just need to order a extension primer and a library primer. This library primer is important to know that depending on the number of amino acids of your library, you need to ask this N here as a seven or a 12, okay? So, you just perform a simple primer annealing and you will obtain this sequence that after an extension, you will have this double sequence with both restriction enzymes that you also have in the vector. After the digestion, you will obtain an insert, a double, a double uh, insert. Uh, with the same cohesive hands that you have in your vector, okay? So finally, you just need to ligate, insert and vector in order to obtain the DNA with um, a library of seven or 12 that you can use for your uh, experiments of phase display. So uh, I don't know if you ever heard the methodology that usually we use to perform phage display. Uh, it is called biopanning. Um, biopanning is basically the incubation of the phage libraries with our target and the selection of the clones, phage clones that are attached to this target. So this is a binding affinity technique. So even this, I will show you here the steps that you need to perform uh, the phase display for the identification of a given receptor in your, in your target. So this is the cycle of a conventional biopanning um, process that you have your phage library here and you have your target. So you can have the target that you wish. So basically um, the libraries can identify any type of target since biological molecules or inorganic materials. And after the exposure, the incubation of your phage library with your target, you will wash away all the unbound phages. That is step B here. 
then the phages that are attached to your target will be eluted and will be amplified in bacteria. These phages that are eluted and amplified in bacteria are going to be used for another round of biopanning. So the phages obtained in the first round are used for the second round. And uh, the ones obtained in the second round are used for the third round. And so on success, uh, uh, until we, we have around four to five rounds of biopanning. Um, we can start collecting in this step some clones randomly um, to sequence. So if we collect random clones to sequence, we can see that after several rounds, we obtain a consensus sequence appearing in these clones. So this is the peptide sequences that are more prevalent. So that are the most um, common sequences to appear after the entire process of biopanning. Okay. okay, this is a conventional biopanning where you have your target adhered in a, in, a, in a plaque, but this technique evolved and uh, we usually use a different biopanning method that uh, was described in 2001. And this is um, a most the most easy method to perform the biopanning because it relies in a simple centrifugation step in an organic phase that allows us to obtain the bound phages and unbound phages separately. So we have first our phage display library as before, but we perform here a clearing step in order to remove from our phage display library all the phages that um, are not going to be able to bind to our target. So imagine here that I have cancer cells. My target is cancer cells, so I want to discover uh, what type of receptors are being expressed in the surface of my cancer cells so what do I need to do for this pre-clearing uh, step? I will use uh, non-cancer cells from the same tissue, okay? So if I have breast tissue, if I have cancer, breast cancer, I will obtain breast tissue healthy in order to perform this clearing of my library. So the first step is to incubate my library with my control cells or my healthy cells. And then these supernatants that are the phages that didn't bound to the control cells are going to be used to incubate with our target cells, that is our cancer cells, okay? And this um, is a simple separation by centrifugation, okay? So we discard the pellet here and we obtain the supernatant to incubate with our target cells. After the second centrifugation step, we need to recover the pellet because that's where we have our control, our um, target cells with our uh, phages attached. This is these phages here that are attached to the cells are going to be also eluted and used for um, another round of biopanning, okay? In, in every round of biopanning, the library is cleared every time we use a, 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 um, a round, we use um, a cleared library, okay? So I will show you here some work that we have been developing here in our group. And uh, some of them are already published, so you can have access to them. And the last one is not. But I will show you here about the identification of uh, some pepti peptides in cancer and in breast cancer and colon cancer. 
So these are two types of cancer that are um, responsible for millions of deaths. So we nowadays have some diagnosis tools, but these tools are, are, are uh, low, uh, have a lower specificity towards the target. So we would like to discover new biomarkers as an alternative for uh, an early diagnosis of this type of cancers. So the final goal of this work is to develop a um, phage particle for drug delivery because we can manipulate this phage particle with the new biomarkers that we discover and we can promote the drug delivery, the target drug delivery in the specific sites. So we used phage display to identify peptide sequences that specifically recognize uh, cell surface receptors at the surface of these types of cancer cells in the breast and in colorectal cancer. So regarding the first work using the breast cancer cells, we just incubate the target cells and we use two types of libraries, one of seven and other of 12 amino acids. And we use the, the phage display, the Brazil methodology, the one that is based on the centrifugation in organic phase. So we here could um, identify two peptide sequences, one with seven amino acids and other with 12. And after performing some assays of immunofluorescence and cytometry, and also to check the affinity of these peptides towards different types of cells, we saw that both of these peptides um, were able to recognize this receptor, leucine 16, that is responsible for cancer progression. So this was a very, a very good result uh, because from this, um, from this result, we can now develop a phage particle that can be directed to this receptor in order to avoid the disease progression. Another work involving uh, breast cancer cells, but a different type. Um, we have incubated our libraries. We have used the Brazil methodology with two phage display libraries and also the conventional uh, biopani methodology with the same two libraries. And we could obtain here also two peptide sequences, one of seven and one of 12 amino acids. So, and after all the assays of um, affinity, uh, we saw that they both um, have a strong affinity towards this type of cancer cells. And one was able to recognize this um, metalloproteinase inhibitor that is strongly correlated with the aggressiveness of this type of tumors. And the 12 amino acid peptide was able to um, recognize this receptor, plasminogen activator inhibitor 1, that is associated with an increase in histological grade and metastasis and decrease in cancer in breast cancer cells. So we can also now, uh, given this information, develop some phage particles in order to target specifically these types of receptors. Regarding the colorectal cancer, we also have used Brazil technology with um, a seven amino acids library and obtained here a peptide with seven amino acids that allow us to to see that it recognizes the MCT1, the transporter that is responsible, uh, in, is involved in the, in the membrane of the cells to perform the, trans, the transport um, of um, some molecules in the membrane of the cells. And it's also implicated in the progression of the, the disease, uh, or in, in this case, the, the colorectal cancer disease. Okay, 
one of the work that is still uh, ongoing, we are still just performing the last uh, phase, is the, is the identification of uh, sequences uh, in osteoarthritic uh, cells or chondrocyte cells. So osteoarthritis is um, a chronic disease. It affects uh, the joints. So um, the, the techniques that usually are uh, used nowadays um, to diagnose this disease are simply x-rays of our MRI and uh, they have low sensitivity and specificity. So we need um, new biomarkers that can be uh, used to target uh, this disease and be used in the clinical practice. So the goal of this work was to develop um, um, a tool, phage-based tool, in order to promote osteoarthritic target therapy and drug specificity. So we used phage display to identify molecules in the surface of osteoarthritic chondrocytes. We have incubated um, a 12 amino acids library using the Brazil methodology with osteoarthritic chondrocytes. We have received the tissue. We have all, um, we had to obtain the cells. We obtained both the normal chondrocytes from LC tissue and the osteoarthritic chondrocytes. So we, after the incubation of our target with our library, we obtain a 12 amino acid um, peptide that um, given the first preliminary results of a bioinformatic analysis, this um, peptide is able to recognize Adams and MMP proteolytic, proteolytic enzymes that are implicated in the degradation of the cartilage. So right now we are um, doing some fluorescence microscopy assays in order to check the specificity of this peptide towards um, a given different types of cells and uh, of osteoarthritic and other cells. So given these uh, works that um, I have been talking so far, we, um, we try to explore the use of this technology and the use of the phages by themselves um, to diagnose or to treat um, Alzheimer's disease. Not only Alzheimer's disease, because we can also use these for other type of neurological diseases, but um, we, cho we chose uh, Alzheimer's because we, we had a collaboration uh, with a group from Amsterdam that they are experts in Alzheimer's. So we decided to join um, both ex expertises and try to develop a phage-based a platform or a tool in order to diagnose or treat this disease. So basically what we needed to discover first was if phages were able to cross the blood brain barrier. As you know, the blood brain barrier is uh, responsible to shelter the brain from all type of, mo of molecules. So it's very difficult to develop um, uh, drugs in order to uh, cross this barrier. So we can, after a search, we saw that the M13 phage, the filamentous phage, is able to cross this barrier and it was found in the brain tissue in several studies. Then we wanted to study a little bit about the disease and how we could address uh, some steps of this disease with our phages. So Alzheimer's disease is a neurodegenerative disorder and it is characterized by the deposition in our brain of um, plaques that are made of amyloid beta, um, that is a peptide. And this peptide is, is released in, in our brain when there are a defect 
in uh, the cleavage of the amyloid precursor protein. So when this happens, we, we have in our brain an accumulation of amyloid beta peptides of 40 or 42 um, amino acids long. And uh, the, um, these, these peptides, they are released in a monomeric form that after that start to aggregate in an oligomeric form. And finally, they deposit as fibrils and plaques in the brain tissue. However, before we reach the plaque state, we saw that the amyloid beta in an oligomeric form uh, already impairs the synaptic function and with a consequent memory disruption. So we wanted to use our phage uh, tool um, to diagnose early species of edita before the formation of these plaques. So we saw that edita 42 is the most toxic species of a beta peptide in the brain. And uh, the, deposit, the formation of this a beta 42 peptide starts before, much before the clinical symptoms appear. So we could really make use of these phages in order to develop an early diagnosis tool. Because when we start having the first symptoms, there's already um, lots of amyloid beta in our brain. So the current tools that are used nowadays to diagnose this disease are based in memory tests or in PET or CT or MRI. But these techniques, they all provide a late diagnosis. As I told you, these amyloid beta oligomeric species start starts to accumulate 20 years before the formation of the clinical symptoms. So we really need a tool that allows us to identify or detect in a much early stage this, this disease. So as I told you, the amyloid beta starts with monomers that starts they, that start to aggregate into oligomers and fibrils, and these fibrils deposit as uh, amyloid plaques. And we saw that the M13 phase by itself is already able to remodel, remodel multiple types of misfolded proteins. Not only amyloid beta, but we saw uh, also that it can remodel alpha synuclein protein, for instance, that is implicated in Parkinson's disease. So this is great news. And um, given all these features that we discovered um, of our phages, M13 phage, so we decided to develop a, a tool, a phage-based tool, to diagnose and treat um, amyloid beta aggregates in the brain. So how are we going to do this? By displaying in a phage surface, peptide sequences able to recognize a beta oligomers and fibrils in the brain. So basically we would like to engineer the M13 phage uh, in order to display at this, uh, its surface some peptides able to recognize oligomers and fibrils of a beta. Then we would like to assess how these engineered phages, um, uh, how they behave uh, when put in contact with amyloid beta, and also if they were able to recognize um, Alzheimer's disease tissue. Um, another step was to check if these phages are able to cross the BBB, the blood brain barrier, and also. Um, the efficiency of crossing. So here, I can only tell you that we have developed three engineered phages. We will call it AB1, 2, AB1, 2, and 3. 
And we have performed some tests by incubating these phages with amyloid beta in vitro. So we can uh, see here that in this assay, the AB, AB, AB2 phage is the one capable of inhibiting the fibril formation. It means that I don't, we don't, we still don't know the mechanism of action of this step of this phage, but we believe that he is able to recognize the oligomers and prevent their aggregation into fibrils. So this phage is able to avoid the progression of the aggregation. Consequently, we hope that it may be able to prevent the progression of the disease. We have performed some uh, uh, other assays and decided to discard the AB, uh, AB1 phage, that is a, sm a smaller phage that was obtained because it was not giving us a very good results. So from now on, we decided only to use AB2 and AB3 for the next experiments. So we have uh, used here an assay to see if the engineered phages are able to cross the blood-brain barrier in an in vitro uh, assay. So we have used basically a trans well where we put uh, cells, epithelial cells that mimic the blood brain barrier. We just had the phages in one side and collected the, the medium in the other side in order to see the concentration of phages in the beginning and in, after the passage. We also had uh, in mind that this crossing of the phages could disrupt barriers. So we have performed an assay to check the, the cell's integrity, because if some of the phage is uh, disrupting this barrier, we cannot use it for in vivo experiments, for instance. So we see here that none of the phages uh, disrupted the barrier. So we have here the M13 control and the AB2 and the AB3. Uh, regarding the crossing capacity, we see the, uh, that AB2 is the phage with the best performance. So AB2, AB3 also passes and M13 also, but AB2 has a superior capacity to overcome this, this barrier. Then regarding this, we have on some floor immunofluorescence assays to see if our phages are able to recognize uh, oligomers and fibrils in uh, brain tissue. In this case, we have used brain tissue from mice, uh, AD, uh, Alzheimer's disease mice, and also from, from human samples, donors with uh, Alzheimer's disease. So we can see here some images from the results with um, the mice tissue. We can see that we use here the three phages, the control, the AB2 and the AB3. And um, in the wild type mice, we don't see any signal because the phage signal would appear in green. And in the APP mice, that is the tissue sections uh, from uh, um, Alzheimer's disease mice, we can see here the green signal with both A beta 2 and A beta 3, but not with M13 phage. So these red dots that we see here are uh, amyloid beta plaques. So as you can see, these plaques only appear in the Alzheimer's disease animals and not in the control animals. Regarding the human samples, we, we also obtain very good results. We have here uh, an increase in the staining with AB2 and AB3 and uh, nothing in, AB, in the M13 control uh, phage. Then we would like to know if uh, injecting in vivo these phages in an animal and recovering the brain and other tissues, we could see phages. 
So here we are, have only used AB2 and we have just performed a preliminary assay with three animals and we have collected blood, brain and liver after we inject this animal with the AB2 phage and with M13 as control all the time, we have used M13 as control. So we can see here that we can actually see here a higher concentration of AB2 phage in the brain of these uh, animals compared with AB3 phage, with M13 uh, phage, sorry. So this is a very, very good result, very promising result. So as a conclusion of um, this work that uh, is, still not, is still not published, we saw that this AB2 AB phage is able to inhibit the fibril formation. It also possesses the highest capacity to cross the blood-brain barrier. And both of the phages are able to recognize uh, oligomers and fibrils in uh, ex vivo tissue. And uh, AB2, that was the only one tested so far, is able to recognize a beta in um, the brain in vivo uh, of uh, Alzheimer's disease animals. For future experiments, we would like to perform chemical functionalization of these phages in order to develop um, a detection tool and also to assess their capacity to restore the synaptic function and the memory formation of these animals. And this is the team that helped to, to achieve all these results. Uh, I just like to acknowledge them. And um, that's it. Thank you very much for, for your attention. So if you would like to ask some questions, I will be available too. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Yvonne. Uh, we've got a whole lot of questions, almost more than 10. Um, this talk was very, very informative. We have seen the applications of phage display techniques, most especially in cancer, osteoarthritis, and also their potential prospects in applying phages as diagnostic tools in Alzheimer's disease. So we'll start this off with questions um, from the first part of the presentation. I guess I'm going to just read them out. I think you'll take note and then we see how you answer them. So Amos Lucky had a question. In the case of phage-based vaccines using display techniques, the first question was between P3 and P8 proteins in M13 phage, which one is likely to have rapid immune response if used? The second was between the genetic and chemical manipulation which one is likely to be effective for vaccine development? And the third, based on the same question, is biopanning affected by cross-reactions? So I don't know, doctor, if you'd like to take them that question first and then we move on to the next. Okay, regarding the first question about the immune response, um, okay, as, as you know, um, Phages are composed by bacteria, uh, by uh, protein uh, capsids. So uh, these protein capsids are immunogenic. So there are uh, a very likely response of the immune system that we, we try to overcome with the repeated administration in vivo in order to compensate the clearance of the immune system. Uh, if I remember you ask if um, P3 or P8 are more, um, are less responsible to increase this immune response, right? So yeah. I I cannot give you that answer because I don't know if the P8 is more immunogenic or the P3 is more immunogenic. Okay, most, most probably altogether they 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 provide they they are responsible of an immune response of the organism, but uh, I cannot state that this one is uh, is giving us a higher response than the other okay um so regarding the other uh question uh, 
uh, if uh, okay if genetic or chemical manipulation are better for vaccine development okay for vaccine development you can um, uh, manipulate genetically the the phage okay you just need to have a, a particle in order to display um, a given uh, part of a given um, um, antigen in order for you to for this particle to be used as a, a vaccine so um, we usually can do this we can see lots of genetic manipulation so this part will be displayed in the protein p3 but we also have the the hypothesis to use the biggest uh, protein of the phage the p8 in order to display this this um, part of the, the antigen so it it's really up to the type of vaccine that you need to develop and uh, i cannot just state that it's better to put it in the p3 or is better to to uh, by genetic manipulation or is better to put it in the p8 by chemical manipulation so it all depends of the type of vaccine that you need okay so I don't know. The last question was. The last question was: Is biopanning affected by cross reactions? Okay, uh, I don't believe so, um, because the the biopan. Okay, the first round of the biopanning, you will do a clearing of the library, and when you use the obtained library, the obtained phage to to in the next rounds of biopanning so you will, you, you will decrease these reactions so you will have a most a more pure uh, library if you know what i mean okay okay um then um more questions came in from amos um he asked is there a specific position of insertion on the protein sequence and does the size of the insertion sequence matter I think a more related question came from Abu Bakr Shaban. Can I, can I, I'm sorry, can I ask this too? Can I reply to this too first? Otherwise yeah, I will okay. forget what. It's okay. <laughs> okay, there are no specific position, okay? Usually we use this, uh, I, I showed you the, the synthesis of the libraries in order to insert between these two restriction enzyme uh, points. But uh, as long as you, um put in the gene three it's okay so you can choose other uh, restriction sites uh regarding the size yes there is a limit um for you to introduce in the gene uh, because we are using the protein three this protein is responsible also for phage attachment and phage recognition of bacteria so it um it, it now it, it's not allowed we cannot clone in the genome in the protein three uh, uh, bigger sequences so we usually use seven or 12 amino acid peptides and i saw a long time ago a study that used uh, around 20 amino acids but it was the most uh, the biggest i saw uh, regarding the size of what we can um, clone in this um, in this phage okay. so okay um, there's many questions coming in, so I'm just going to pick. Um, Angela Makumi asked, how will the M13 be delivered into the eukaryotic cell? Are there any in vivo studies like in mice to see if the M13 can be neutralized in the host? Okay, M13 is, um, is a phage. It does not infect uh, eukaryotic cells, okay? What we can do in order for this phage to penetrate the phage is to put at its surface um, cell penetrating peptide, for instance, okay, to promote the passage of um, the, this phage to the interior of the cell. Uh, regarding the other question, can you please remind me? Um, are there any in vivo studies like in mice to see if the M13 can be neutralized in host? Yeah, there are some uh, studies that already 
uh, try to to see the immune response of some phages and this these in particular these m13 phages they they can hold in the bloodstream of the um, of mice in this case uh, for as, as long as um, 48 hours okay we have done also this assay in in our diet distribution uh, tests um, in these preliminary uh, assays and we saw that um, at 48 hours that was still a residual concentration of the phages in the bloodstream of the the animals in mice uh, however the the immune response um, the first immune response is also the most aggressive. And then as we continue the administration, um, the phages are able to maintain for longer periods of time in the, in the organism. Okay, um, not to waste much more time. I'll just have one last question. <laughs> um, the rest of the questions I'll forward them to you so that you see whether you can answer them. The last question is um, what level of lab sophistication is needed for these kinds of studies? And what advice would you give to the lab which would want to begin phage diagnostic studies in regards with how to begin? Okay, for phage display experiments, you don't need uh, a lab with that much equipment, okay? This is a very cheap technique. Uh, we just need the target, um, the phage library, and uh, some solutions. If you are using, for instance, the Brazil methodology, you, you will need to, the, the reagents for the organic phase separation. Uh, however, you cannot do much after you identify by sequencing the peptide that is being expressed, okay? You just need to perform more tests. For instance, you can buy that uh, peptide and uh, synthetic peptides are um, they are not they they are very expensive uh, in order for you to you can do the in vivo assays but you if you don't have that in your laboratory you need to establish collaborations as as i did uh, but uh, regarding the phage display technique itself even for the chemical manipulation it's not a very difficult thing to do and is not uh, very expensive to, to perform this, okay? The, the most expensive part is obviously the in vivo assays that if you want to test your, your phages or your peptides in a, a model of uh, any kind of disease. Okay, I don't know then. if I answer everything. <laughs> I will send the other questions that have been um, provided in the chat because there are quite many. But yeah. I'd like to thank you so much, Dr. Yvonne, for taking us through this very informative session. I believe we have all picked something. And thank you all for your contributions. I'd like to hand over to Jessica to end this webinar. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks thank everyone for coming. It was wonderful to see you all again. It's been too long. And thanks, Ivana. That was awesome. I'm going to call and have a wonderful day slash night slash morning. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye.